Okay, well, good evening, everybody. I'm glad y'all came out today. Uh, I don't know about y'all, I really enjoyed this morning. Uh, it has been, um, it's been a little while since uh, we've had the Lord's Supper. We've been bouncing around a little bit, so I was really, really glad to be able to participate in that with y'all this morning. All right, so tonight we're going to do limited atonement. We're, we're in the middle of a, a study refuting Calvinism. And, uh, and this is something that, that I do feel pretty strongly about, um, and I do think it needs to be refuted. Uh, there, there is a lot of it around, so, but I'll tell you, the, this one, this particular uh, element of, of the acronym, Limited Atonement, to me is probably one of the easiest ones for me to refute. And the reason for that is that there's not a single Bible verse in the entire Bible that says that Jesus died only for the elect. And so if, if atonement is limited, and I guess we can start there, and so the, the Calvinist view of limited atonement is this, that uh, the way I understand it anyway, is that uh, God the Father decided before he created creation that he had a, a elect few, a select few that he would save and that he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross only for those people. And so atonement is limited and it's limited only to the people that are what the Calvinists would call the elect. Um, and so the, the other side of that coin would be that that God sent his son to die for the world, for everyone, but only some accept it. Only some will accept him. Only some will, uh, through faith, accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, it's true, I think, that, um, that the atonement is applied only to some. But there's nowhere in Scripture that, Bible, that the Bible says that Jesus only died only for some. But over and over and over what we find in Scripture is that Jesus died for all. We see words like all and the world and whosoever and everyone. And, and, and it just, you know, those kinds of words, those inclusive words that I would take to mean everybody. That he died for everyone. And if he died for everyone, then everyone has has that option, has that, uh, has that calling in their life that when they're called to accept Christ. Now, of course, not all will, and we know that to be true. Um, so let's, let's start in Romans chapter 10. And here, here's the thing. I guess I should say this. As far as I can tell, most of your Reformed people are going to rely very heavily on logic, philosophy, those kinds of things, drawing inferences and, um, and, 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 and taking that they believe in, in Calvinism. So they, uh, they tend to, if this is true, then this is true. So if the argument is that if you assume I'm right, then I'm right, to me that's not a good argument. Um, so he, here's what I think. I think and I know that Scripture trumps logic. Tr scripture always trumps hu human logic. Scripture always trumps human philosophy every time. So if there are verses in the Bible that say, that Christ died for all, like John 3.16, one of the most well-memorized verses in the entire Bible that says that God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life, then I, I believe that trumps logic. Um, and, and I think that's really what we need for this particular argument is just, just one verse, right? Uh, so what... And so we'll know, I guess, to try to be a little bit fair. 
a, a, a Calvinist or a Reformed people would say that, that the Bible, when it talks about the world or all, that that world is only the world of the elect and not counting others. And so I would say to that, if I can find just one verse that absolutely for sure says that somebody besides one of the elect was died for by Christ, then again, I, I think I've trumped the argument. So let's just read some scripture. Romans 10, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That sounds very inclusive to me. We see the word all a couple of times. We see whosoever shall be saved. It's very similar to John 3.16, words of Jesus. And, um, and so, you know, that, there it is. And, and, and hundreds, I would say. There, there are a hundred verses in the Bible that sound just about like that. Okay, uh, let's see. Go to another one. About 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And so one of the, one of the arguments, what I would consider a philosophical argument for limited atonement, is the idea that... Um, the idea of Trinitarian harmony is what they call it. And so what that, what that means to them is that, that the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, are all one and in accord with each other. And so if the Father only willed that some be saved, and the Son came and died for all, then they're in an argument. And so the argument goes this way. So the Calvinist argument goes like this. That God the Father only wanted some to be saved. So if Jesus came with the intention to try to save all, now they're in a fight. Of course, that doesn't, we know that can't be, right? And so they know that can't be. So they use that argument to throw out there. So the question would be this. Is that true that God willed that only some be saved? And so I'm looking here in, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, and what does it say? Talking about God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, right? Um, another one would be 2 Peter 3 and 9, very similar. Okay, 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the Bible clearly says to me that God is long suffering toward men, that he, not that he has chosen a select few. That, so why would God need to be long suffering? Why would there be any purpose behind a long-suffering God, a patient God, if he already had chosen a select few and there was no doubt at all that, they would, that he would force salvation into their lives? He wouldn't, there would be no purpose for the Bible to say that God is long-suffering. It would be a mute point. Um, and I just lost one of my bookmarks. It slid right out on me. And I have quite a few. Okay. How about, um, how about John 14 and a parable that Jesus uh, told? Uh, John 14, verse 16. 
Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that, so that servant came and showed these, the, his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as, as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste my supper. And so we see here the call going out. The call, the, the, what we would call the gospel call going out to the world. And, and notice that he calls over and over and over. He calls... Groups of people over and over. This, this, these people didn't want to come. We're calling these people and these people. And let's call some more people. It sounds very inclusive to me. And God uh, is wanting his house to be filled. That's his will here. Is that his house be full. That as many as possible join him uh, in his supper. And so this is, this is the God that Jesus knew. This is the God who Jesus came from came down from, that is part of. Uh, he's, he's speaking here of things he knows firsthand about God in heaven. And so, <clears throat> so to me, it, and, and it's, you know what, it's, it's interesting, it's a little hard to refute something when it seems to me to be very weak, <laughs> I've, I've, you know, so um, again, scripture after scripture after scripture, we see the same, uh, same ideas. Uh, we see God, uh, Jesus saying that he is the light of the world, right? Um, and, and whosoever follows him, right? Um, let's see, we can turn, well, let, uh, another argument that we see is is what they call double jeopardy, um, and so the argument goes like this: that that if if Jesus died for all sins of everybody, then then even the lost sins have been atoned for, so people. We know that people die and go to hell, so if they go to hell for sins that Jesus has atoned for, then, then there's double payment for that sin, and that can't be true. And, and there, uh, there are some, some kind of famous works, that, um, books that, that put that forward, and so there's a lot of, this is one of the main ideas that a Calvinist will use, is that if Jesus died for everybody, um, then, then their sins, including their unbelief, would be paid for, and so then everybody would have to go to heaven. So the assumption is that if you're not a Calvinist uh, and you believe that, that Jesus atoned for all sins, that we don't really have a leg to stand on to say that even though he atoned for all, he, he died and loved everyone and wants everyone to be saved, but we don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to the limited application of that atonement, then I would turn it right back on them and say, well then, how do you say that all men are dead in their sins if their sins have been atoned for from the beginning? Because a person could never have been dead under that philosophy, under that, that way of thinking that the elect, the ones who will be saved, would have had their sins covered from the beginning of time, right? And so they could never have been dead. They were always alive. 
And so a Calvinist would have to believe also limited application only at the point of regeneration. They call it regeneration. And when God regenerates somebody, that, that, would, be, that would have to be, even according to their own doctrine, when their sins were atoned for, or else they could not have been dead before that. So you can, if they're going to say we can't say limited application, then how, why does that not also apply to their philosophy and their doctrine? I believe, you know, when I, you really look at it, um, the argument for Calvinism, especially, especially on limited atonement, is very, very weak. Um, you know, Sproul said, said that it's all about design, and I, I think he's probably right. Um, the question really is, how did God design salvation? What was his design? What was his purpose? What did he decide to do when he did it? And, and I think he would agree with me, that, and I agree with him, that God has the right to do whatever he wants to do. It's his world. It's his creation. He can design it any way he wants. But that design is laid out to me very clearly in Scripture to be Jesus died for all, the whole world, everyone. So I'm going to go over to 1 John 2.2. 2. I know I'm skipping around a lot, but to me the best way to refute this particular one is to read Scripture because there's lots and lots of Scripture that, that tell us exactly this. Remember, remember I said that that the Calvinists will say, yes, the Bible says many times that Jesus died for all in the world, but that what the Bible really means when it says that is that the world of the elect or all of the elect or whosoever who are elect. Uh, and so the question would be, is, are there verses that would, that, would, um, that would say that Jesus really did die for all and, and really what, what we would need, what I would need, is just, just one verse that says that Jesus died for everybody, including somebody who is not elect. And so let's read 1 John 2, 2. And he is the perpetuation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so what we see in this verse is we see Jesus is the perpetuation, and he's talking to the little children. He says, my little children, he's talking about the church, that he's writing to, uh, save people who the Calvinists would say are the elect. He's saying uh, he's the perpetuation for our sins, talking to the church, but not only for us, for us only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So now we're very inclusive now. Now we're talking about the saved and not only the saved, but also the whole world, which would obviously to me include not just the elect, as they would say. And, and we see this concept multiple times through the book of 1 John, where the world, and, and very often in Scripture, the world is talking about not the elect, not the church, not Christians, but actually lost people. Another one that, that says that you can go to is 2 Peter 2.1. And this one, I think, may be even more clear. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false uh, teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And so now we're talking certainly not about the church, Certainly not about the elect. Certainly not about saved people. We're talking about false prophets who, the Bible says, denies the Lord that bought them. Jesus paid the price even for the false teachers who would deny him. He, he died and paid the price enough, enough grace for everybody. Even the people who hate him. Even the people... 
and, 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 and here's, you know, the truth of the Bible is that all of us at some point hated God. We were all against Him. We all had sinned and fallen short. We all had turned against God's design and God's plan and God's ways and God's truth. And so, there's enough grace even for us, even for all, even for these teachers, even these false teachers who would, as the Bible says, uh, privately, secretly sneak in these damnable heresies. Now, that's pretty bad. That's strong language, isn't it? And yet there's enough grace even for them. So if these people who are bringing heresies into the church would humble themselves and accept Christ, He would save them. Y'all, that's a wonderful truth. That's a wonderful truth. How fearful would it be to live in a world knowing that we had all been lost at some point in our lives, right? Every one of us. How, how scary would the world be to think, maybe Jesus didn't die for me. Maybe I'm not one of the ones that he died for. Maybe there's not enough grace for me. But I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. There's not one single verse that I can find anywhere that says that Jesus only died for some. Every single verse, Jesus died for all. So whoever, all these inclusive words, the world. And y'all, the Calvinists don't have a scripture to go to in this, that where it says, not one that says that. But we've, we've seen scriptures, uh, many, many scriptures that say that Jesus died for all. And we see at least two here where Jesus specifically died for lost people. And you know, that's very interesting because Jesus himself said that the, uh, the healthy don't need a doctor. Right? I come to seek and to save those who were lost. He died for lost people. And who incl- who's included in the lost people? Everybody. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. And the Bible says we're, we have all been lost. That's everybody, the whole world. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find a, a good argument against me here, but um, another one would be that I see sometimes is that if Jesus died for everybody and only... Um, and only some get saved, then Jesus is a failure. Well, of course, nobody wants to say that their Lord is a failure. But to imply that that my doctrine implies that Jesus is a failure is just foolishness. Because Jesus overcome everything. He overcome the world. He has victory over death, over sin, over Satan, over everything in this world. He has the victory if anybody's a failure, it's the human beings who refuse to accept Christ. And so to put the failure on Christ is shocking and unbelievable to me. Especially for a people who will begin with total depravity and say all are depraved. And then turn around and say, but if he only saves some, then Christ is a failure. It can't be. And I don't believe that, you know, not one iota. It's just not, the case is not, I don't think anybody believes that. Um, let's see. So MacArthur um, says that, that, that we're dead in our sins and dead men can't accept, they can't ask, they can't accept a gift. Dead men can do nothing. I think we maybe have talked about that one a little bit already. Um, but the interesting thing about that is if Calvinism really is true and you take their logic and run it out, then they were never dead to begin with if they're elect. And I think we talked about that already. So, you know, this one may be short and sweet. We can, we can have some discussion on this. I think 
And, and again, many scriptures, many scriptures that we can keep talking about. Um, so thank you.